16-bit horror. In a time before it was thought video games could scare you or make you cry, Clock Tower would emerge as the quintessential game on fear. Across a game console dominated by high-jumping plumbers and a Peter Pan-inspired adventurer, Clock Tower would bring a dark atmosphere of dread, tension, and helplessness in your desperate attempt to survive. This was before the idea of survival horror games even existed. Let's take a deep, voyeuristic look at how one man defied an industry, crafted fear, and created an iconic killer. From the films that inspired the game, to pioneering a design of a new genre in gaming. Before we get into the terror-filled history that is Clock Tower, I got a question for you. What do you see? If you look below, they say you'll see a subscribe button. Many say it's in red, and you can click it. And then you can click the bell icon next to it to stay up to date with all the uploads on this channel, as it really helps out this channel. So without further ado, let's get into the history that is Clock Tower on the Super Nintendo. Best we start from the beginning, beginning. See, horror is fear. And where is fear? But from the mind. And where is the mind? But within the man. So we must start with the man behind Clock Tower. Ifumi Kono. Hailing from the port city of Nagata, Japan, Hifumi Kono was an avid film and TV watcher who enjoyed a healthy dose of the dark and the horrific. I did watch a lot of horror shows and TV shows about paranormal activity growing up. Some of the movies I watched were Phenomena, Suspiria, The Omen, and The Exorcist, to name a few. I grew up during the golden age of occult horror and loved to ponder about these strange phenomena that could occur as I watched those movies as a child. My main sources of inspiration to this day are those films, Hifumi Kono. By the time he was in his fourth year of university, an economics major studying to become an accountant, he began to question himself. Graduation was upon him, and suddenly he had no idea what he wanted to do. But he needed to start looking for a job. I have to work. It was 1991. Kono did receive job offers from a bank and a major manufacturing company. He was an accounting major after all. Yet math and numbers did not satisfy him for something else crossed his path while in school. While at university, I was on the archery team, and I also belonged to a strategy wargaming club. While in this club, I created my own board game, and everyone liked it and played it frequently. Their reaction made me happy, so that's how I became interested in creating games for people to enjoy. The board game slash card game he created was on the Japanese Mafia, better known as the Yakuza. What was the game called again, Kono? The name of the board game was Ishmael, for some reason. <laughs> the satisfaction Kono felt from his friends enjoying and playing his board game was huge. So huge that it made him question four years of schooling. As he thought about it more and more, well, they come as if from outer space in a variety of weird guises. Defender, Pac-Man, asteroids. He figured, why not? Let's give video games a shot. He had no connections in the industry, and lacking the existence of an internet, Kono went to the local store and bought a gaming magazine. Rummaging through the pages, he wanted to work at a game company that had a diverse portfolio of games across various genres. 
he found three companies that seemed promising and sent off his resume. They were telling at Japan, Human Entertainment, and Koei Tecmo. This was back when Koei Tecmo was simply Koei. Oh, my bad. He would choose Human Entertainment to work at because they were the only ones that got back to him. Yes. Please don't hurt us. That all depends on you. We did. I want to play a game. No. Then he dies no. right now. No. It isn't by accident that so many games have found success in the horror setting. The goals of video games and the goals of horror fiction directly overlap. Now I'm playing with power! Making them ideal bedfellows. Richard Rouse III, game designer, The Suffering, and The Suffering II, The Ties That Binds. Leaving his war game club behind, Kono graduated college in 1992. And went straight to work at Human Entertainment. Kono would get to unleash his creative aspirations to pioneer new and innovative games across an entire spectrum of genres. So, Human Entertainment put Kono to work on a sports game. Then, another sports game. And then, another sports game. Human made a lot of sports games, because... They made money. Where the rest of Japan was in an economic downfall, the video game industry was on the rise. The Super Famicom, aka the Super Nintendo in the US, was in a console war against rival Sega with their Mega Drive system, known as the Genesis in North America. The competition against these two rivals only helped to improve the quality and the quantity of games, with 179 games released in 1992 on the Super Famicom in Japan. Game classics such as Final Fantasy V and Super Mario Kart came out that year. However, a genre particularly absent from the vast array of releases was the horror genre. With the exception of Sweet Home, the only horror games that existed that time were action games with a horror flavor, like Splatterhouse, and that was not my ideal version of horror. Kono would aim to mend this, but... Sports games. Human did a lot of sports games. From Super Fire Pro Wrestling to Waku Waku Ski Wonder Spur. Human left no type of sports game unturned. Human's upper management made a policy of only producing sports games because they were guaranteed money makers. Though for a creative imagineer such as Kono, He longed to do a game that could showcase his repressed creativity. Always on the lookout for new games to play and inspire him, a colleague of Kono's introduced him to Alone in the Dark. Now, Alone in the Dark is not a well-known game in Japan, and it wasn't even in Japanese, so Kono didn't understand the game's story, and he kept dying over and over. But its unique gameplay and ominous atmosphere created a lasting impression on Kono. Some quote Alone in the Dark as the first survival horror game. With its static pre-rendered backgrounds creating camera angles where you weren't exactly sure what could be lurking around the corner. The story that Kono knew nothing about was about a detective named Carnby, sent to a mansion to investigate the apparent suicide of the owner. Upon entering the mansion, all sorts of strange creatures and ghostly beings come after you. You do a lot of running away, sometimes you fight enemies with a pretty clunky combat system, you find a lot of items and piece together puzzles in order to survive and escape the mansion. Kono knew he wanted to make a game like this. Luckily, like Kono, many of his fellow colleagues had humaned were itching to do something other than sports games. So, a bunch of us got together and attempted to convince the higher-ups that we wanted to make something besides a sports game. Okay, group's in session. Straight talk only in this room. That led to a competition in-house to determine the best game we could come up with. I came in first, and that's how work on Clock Tower began. And with that, the development of terror would begin.
Impressive, isn't it? The school only occupies the main building. The others are closed because they're not safe. Never go into them, ever. In a contest for a new game pitch at Human, all submissions were handed over to their respective bosses to be evaluated in private. All Kono knew was that he won. Winner! And now he and a team of seven other developers would see his idea come to fruition. He had pitched a simulation game. Along the lines of human student releases, these more innovative non-sports titles came from Human's Creative School. Established in 1990, it was a one-year school designed to teach students how to become game developers. A first of its kind, as many of Human's more innovative game titles were made by students as their final project, like Septatron, known as SOS in the US, about rescuing people on a sinking ship, not the Titanic. Then there was also a little known title called The Fireman that was doing the Mario Sunshine hose mechanic before Mario Sunshine was even a glimmer in Nintendo's eye. Now in SOS, you were trying to survive a sinking ship. However, in this simulation that Kono had in mind, you must survive the evil chasing you. And your only defense was to run. The atmosphere. From my perspective, I feel this is crucial to horror. Gimmicks that scare you, like a jack-in-the-box <laughs> or a sequence of gory scenes, don't make a good horror product. Creating the atmosphere and slowly breaking down the psychological barriers for horror for the monster to make its appearance. This is a classic and mainstream method in horror, but is most difficult to prevent. When done properly, I think it is the ideal method of creating horror. It was in 1994 to 95 era. But for inspiration, Kona would look beyond the current landscape of horror films of the day that were in sequel madness. Releases like Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. Yes, that is Paul Rudd in the film. Nightmare on Elm Street was in its seventh film with Wes Craven's new nightmare. And the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was in its fourth film. I'm gonna kill you. For Kono, it was time to go back to the 80s and the reign of the slasher film. One particular horror film from 1985 caught his eye. Phenomena, starring a very young Jennifer Connelly in her first leading role. We're talking pre-labyrinth Jennifer Connelly. From the visionary director Dario Argento, Phenomena is about Connelly's character, also named Jennifer, who has just transferred to a new school, and it turns out there's a killer on the loose murdering the students. The phenomena is that Jennifer has a psychic ability to communicate with bugs. Yes, you, you heard that right. She is the Bug Whisperer, and this bug connection may be the key to catching the killer. Adoring the film, Kono modeled the character you would play as in his game after Jennifer Connelly's character, Jennifer Corvino, and he named her Jennifer Simpson. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. Yeah. When asked about using a female protagonist in the game, which was rare back in those days, Kono replied, That would be the influence of the 80s horror films that I've been watching. In my mind, the only good horror had female protagonists. It's also better to see young women screaming than old men screaming. <laughs> Kono's favorite director, Dario Argento, would concur. I like women. Especially beautiful ones. If they have a good face and figure, I would much prefer to watch them being murdered than an ugly girl or man. Dario Argento. The famous filmmaker Brian De Palma of Scarface, Carrie, and the thriller Dressed to Kill had this to say on the subject. Women in peril work better in the suspense genre. It all goes back to the perils of Pauline. If you have a haunted house and you have a woman walking around with a candelabrum, you fear more for her than you would for a husky man, Brian De Palma. And so the story in Clock Tower would go. Raised in the Granite Orphanage, Jennifer and her friends were unexpectedly wanted as adopted daughters by one mysterious Simon Burroughs, and they would go to live in his mansion. And of course, at the mansion's top is a clock tower. 
Jennifer and her fellow orphans, along with their teacher, Miss Mary, arrive at the giant mansion. And it wouldn't be long before curiosity turns to horror as Jennifer's friends become victims of a madman. It's left up to Jennifer to survive and uncover the dark secrets that lie within the Burroughs mansion. In a book for which many a YouTuber and writing teacher recommend, Men, Women, and Chainsaws by Carol Clover, coined the infamous concept of the final girl. The one character of stature who does live to tell the tale is in fact, the final girl. She is introduced at the beginning and is the only character to be developed in any psychological detail. We understand immediately from the attention paid it that hers is the main storyline. She is intelligent, watchful, level-headed, the first character to sense something amiss, and the only one to deduce from the accumulating evidence the pattern and extent of the threat. The only one, in other words, whose perspective approaches our own privileged understanding of the situation. Hey, what's that? Have you seen Claire today? No, she went home. No, she didn't. No one knows where she is. We register her horror as she stumbles on the corpses of her friends. Carol Clover. Kona wanted the animations for Jennifer to be and feel as realistic as possible. Kona would use digitized graphics by photographing a real person doing all the actions that Jennifer would do in the game. A technique made famous for its use in the game Prince of Persia. The motion actress for Jennifer was a lady that I worked with in the planning division. After explaining the concept of the title for the day of the shooting, she wore a white blouse and navy blue skirt. This was used as Jennifer's outfit in the game. This motion actress did some great work with an animation for tackling enemies. She did such a wonderful job, including hanging from a projection above the entrance to the roof terrace and stumbling in the hallway, that most of the motions in the game came from her acting. Taking these images of the actress and then importing it into a computer, then the computer would convert it into a computer-generated image, which enabled the team to really speed up the workflow, and it was super cutting-edge tech at the time. And playing as Jennifer in the game further endears you to her. Also with horror, Jennifer's innocence and beauty would contrast well against the vile evil. And good contrast creates good conflict, and that is what great stories are made of. Now Kono just had to create a monster, a killer. Something up there with the likes of a Michael Myers, a Freddy Krueger, or a Jason Voorhees. Now that Kono had Jennifer in the Clock Tower Mansion, he would need to fill it with all sorts of evil. What makes these houses terrible is not just their Victorian decrepitude, but the terrible families, murderous, incestuous, cannibalistic, that occupy them. Carol Clover. Which meant Kono had to find his devil incarnate. Would this be a fiend, like Psycho's Norman Bates, a maniac in sheep's clothing, or a more grotesque monster? like that of Leatherface in the Texas Chainsaw films. One strange slasher film that affected Kono was The Burning, where the killer uses a pair of garden hedge clippers to slaughter a bunch of horny teens at a summer camp. That's all. The iconic image of the killer named Cropsy holding the clippers above his head had a strong traumatic effect on Kono. And yeah, that's uh, young Jason Alexander from Seinfeld fame. Yeah, he had hair. Who would have thought? There was also the manga Left Hand of God, Right Hand of the Devil, by Kazuo Yumezu. There's a scene in the Rusted Scissors episode where a pair of scissors are thrust into the mouth of someone, and well, I'm sure you can imagine the rest. I'll just say, it's quite cheeky. So Clock Tower's killer would carry a giant pair of scissors. The great thing about scissors is that unlike weapons like axes, which would instantly incapacitate and kill a victim, a pair of scissors will pinch together your flesh, inflicting a dull pain, and then snip, 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 causing further pain as your flesh is cut open. The pain isn't momentary, making it all the more horrifying. That's disgusting. 
Well, there were a few lines I didn't want to cross personally. I wasn't going to show things like heads getting cut off or guts spilling all over the place. Clock Tower was a game more about indirect expression of terrifying situations. Because of that, I didn't really run into any problems with content. In Japan, at least. Elsewhere, though, we'll come back to this. The design of the killer himself was shorter in stature and had a school-esque uniform possibly influenced by the size of the killer in Phenomena. The part about Scissorman being a child was most strongly influenced by Phenomena. I knew it! Scissorman. He would be this unstoppable force that could appear anywhere to cut you down. And if he did kill you, he would do a little dance, giving him more, you know, personality, and more creep factor. The mansion was big, and even if you managed to get away from Scissorman, there were other evils that dwelled here. A floating doll in a room reminiscent of Dario Argento's film Deep Red, with the dolls hanging by a noose. Or a walking killer clown. Deep Red also had a walking puppet scene. Then there's a mirror, which can get jealous of your reflection and strangle you. And there's a parrot that's as evil as its masters. And also, maybe not all of Jennifer's friends are on her side. Not to mention the monstrosity that lies below. Jennifer will uncover secret rooms, occult objects, occult reading material, occult wall drawings, lots of occult to uncover the occult going ons in the Burroughs Mansion and who Scissorman really is. The most important thing for me was the stillness, nothing happening. Just walking down the hallways in complete silence. The only sound you hear is the echo of footsteps. In creating those moments of stillness, I think I succeeded in making the appearance of Scissor Man and the fear of the sound of his scissors more effective. As with the way horror goes, There are many ways for you to die, as Jennifer. As well as many deaths for her fellow Orphanites. A shower scene reminiscent of Psycho. Or a colorful glass ceiling taken straight from Suspiria. As the story elements came into place, Kona would still need to perfect the gameplay. Unfortunately, members of his team thought the gameplay wasn't working, and would never work. All of my game designs are based on a series of logical steps, so my process is pretty much solidified at the proposal stage. So once development started, I only had to focus on things like the flow of the story, creating the map, and event production. However, there was only one problem. Outside of the text adventure genre, the idea of not being able to attack or defeat your enemies was a very foreign concept for games back then. The text adventure which Kono refers to is the games of the late 1970s, like Colossal Cave Adventure, and Zork, games that had no graphics and were only mere text on screen. You'd type in a word and the game would reply. Depending on your word choices, you could progress to the next part of the game. Then as we wander into the mid 80s, the advent of the point and the click interfaces would pave the way for the point and click adventure games. And it would be this style of game that would be the template for a clock tower. On the US side, Sierra and Lucasfilm were the front runners of this era. Yes, of George Lucas, of Star Wars, yeah, all that stuff. Ushering in a golden age of point and click adventure. Sierra with their Kingsfield series and Lucasfilm with games such as Sam and Max and The Secret of Monkey Island. There were countless others. Point and click adventure games were known for having rich narratives, item management, puzzle solving, and dialogue trees with action combat usually being held to a bare minimum, if at all. Kono incorporated many of these elements into Clock Tower. You are utilizing that arrow, basically your mouse cursor, to click where you want Jennifer to go. This is how you navigate the mansion, find essential items, solve puzzles, and run for your life. 
You're constantly moving that arrow around to see if there's anything, anything you can click on. You'll just be doing this with a controller instead of a mouse. Kona was forced to develop Clock Tower for the Super Nintendo. Even though it was 1995 and the PlayStation along with the Sega Saturn were in full swing, the next generation in gaming consoles had arrived. Since Clock Tower was not a sports game, it was considered high risk and that meant it had to have a lower budget. Which also is the reason Clock Tower would not be compatible with the mouse from Mario Paint. Which was a painting game that had a mouse accessory. Another problem was that the new games on the PlayStation and the Saturn were utilizing 3D graphics made up of polygons. Nintendo's next console, the N64, would also utilize these types of graphics, but it was still a year away from releasing. Human at the time had no 3D artists, but they had plenty of 2D artists who were all too comfortable with the SNES. So all paths for Clock Tower led to the Super Nintendo. Additionally, the leadership system with directors and team members wasn't clearly established at Human Entertainment back then, making it unclear who had the right to make the final call on game decisions. I'd only been with the company for two years by then, so everyone on my team either had the same seniority as me or more. This made things more difficult. The hierarchy at Human originally had no leaders in development. The idea being that everyone's input would be seen as equal. Then design disagreements flourished. They learned fast that this did not work, and they put project leads in place ASAP. In modern game development, you'll see a lot of teams sitting together, regardless of what their specialty is. Human entertainment, however, was laid out so that, for example, all the planners would sit in one place. Artists, programmers, sound people were also grouped this way. They'd all be separated, rather than just one team sitting together. I recall things like artists not being particularly friendly with one another. According to Kono, this led to each department having the mentality that they were the best at what they did. Adeline, it's nice to see you. Brown-haired niece, you continue to exist. Whether it be the graphics artists or the planners, and they also had little to no understanding of what the other department did. There was a real pride thing going. People just didn't get along well. Now you might think all this pride and arguing led to a horrendous workplace, but Kono admits... Actually, I think it had a positive effect. Because people couldn't get along and were always arguing, everyone got really passionate and fired up about what they in particular were creating. The devs under Kono for Clock Tower were very passionate at letting him know about their feelings about the game, telling him just running and hiding from Scissor Man wouldn't work. One dev in particular was very defiant to Kono, telling him Clock Tower's gameplay was boring. Still, Kono held strong with his vision and pushed the game forward. He may have relented a bit by letting Jennifer stop Scissorman with a few environmental tools at her disposal, such as a bookshelf or some bug spray. But like all true horror slashers, he'd always be back. Scissorman himself would have a tune to add more terror to his appearance. It's a faster paced and more in your face theme to get your heart pumping. You'll be running away to this theme often. And in the running is where Jennifer's health lies. The more she runs, the more her health goes down, as seen in the color change in the bottom left picture of her. The only way to regain your health is to not run. Seems obvious. Jennifer will drop into her resting state. Disclaimer though, if you keep running with her in red, there is a chance Jennifer will trip and fall while running, which never happens in movies. Okay, maybe it happens a lot. 
the game would also have nine possible endings, giving it replay value. But with all the elements in place, Kono just had to manage and convince his, at times, defiant team to bring Clock Tower to the finish line. So, I had to ask some people nicely if they could help, and tell others assertively to do as I say. That's how he completed Clock Tower. With Kono's strong vision and workplace manners, Clock Tower was finished. Now, it was ready to be judged by the public. Ooh. Now, what we know is that on September 14th, 1995, Clock Tower releases on the Super Famicom, which is also my birthday date. Go figure. And is a great success on the Super Famicom. There is also a version released for the Wonder Swan. Remember that system? Yeah, me either. Critics and players praised the game for its unique and innovative playstyle, and that it was actually scary. Those on the Clock Tower dev team who doubted the game were then all too happy to say they worked on the game. Yet the game would never see release in the US of A. Oh why, oh why is that? Well, from what I've gathered, it was already late in the life of the Super Nintendo, and the higher-ups at Human may have felt that the time and the money and effort it would take to do a US version was just not worth it financially. There was also the censorship situation in the US at the time. One year before Clock Tower released, the US was implementing a rating system for games. It's possible fearing Clock Tower would get a mature rating, and that Human didn't think it would be worth it if they had to spend time and money to censor the game in the US. Clock Tower would later even receive a port to the Nintendo Wii and the Wii U, yet this was only a digital download for Japan only. Yet fear not, my gaming aficionados, as you can still play Clock Tower today. There are fan translations online. A simple internet search will point you in the right direction. I type nothing. 